Gracious God, we gather this day for worship and fellowship in the shelter of our beautiful church building. We had planned to be outdoors in the beauty of your creation, but these refreshing rains have sent us back home. We thank you for our church and our amazing building that we share with the community in so many ways, but we especially thank you for the people who truly are your church. We are a family, and like any family, we may not always agree, but we love each other, and we come together as one when it really matters. We thank you for this church's history as a beacon of light for social justice on the issues of our times. Help us maintain our place as a more light congregation offering shelter and acceptance for all your children. Help us to know how we can make a difference to end gun, gun violence, to know how we can end some of the carnage in our streets and especially in our schools. Help us to turn our swords into plowshares. As a family, church family, we care about one another, we share our joys and our burdens. We pray for the Tabrock family, the Lynn family, the Gottschall family, the Blair family, Linda Lewis, and others. We thank you for our youth and ask your hand of protection and blessing on them as they go to serve the people of Erie, Pennsylvania this summer. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Park with 
with this, you know, I like to just kind of let my hair down, what hair I have, and uh, <laughs> have a little more casual time together and uh, do a little story time sermon. Uh, how many remember Prairie Home Companion, Garrison Keeler? Uh, you know, that's kind of the inspiration, uh, that kind of storytelling that I just enjoyed so much over the years and heard him uh, out at uh, uh, Chautauqua uh, one summer when we lived in Erie and uh, listened to him over the years. And uh, so in the spirit of uh, Garrison Keeler and uh, that kind of homespun kind of storytelling, I've been telling stories about uh, an imaginary couple, Bill and Susie. So these are the latest adventures of Bill and Susie. Probably a retired couple, probably in their 70s as I imagine them. Susie knew she shouldn't say it, but she just couldn't help herself. Her husband Bill had promised he would mow the lawn each day for the last week, but they were, there he was, sitting on the couch, watching the baseball game. It was Saturday afternoon, and they were going to have family over on Sunday for their granddaughter's 10th birthday. She knew she shouldn't say it, but she did. She said, do I have to do everything around here? Bill looked over at her, but didn't say anything. And his silence only made her keep going. I did all the shopping, cleaned the house, and now I'm going to make a cake. Do I have to mow the lawn, too? I told you I would get it done, and I will, Bill said. When, Susie asked. You said you would do it yesterday, and now today is half over. Well, the Mets were losing anyway, so Bill thought, I guess I'll go do it, but I want to let her know I'm mad and not happy about it. So he tried to slam the screen door on the way out, but it only hissed and gently closed, <laughs> like screen doors do. Bill opened the garage door to get the lawnmower, and the first thing his eyes landed on was his locked gun cabinet. He loved his guns. He had some vintage rifles and some collector handguns. He used to hunt deer. But lately, the only time he used his guns was when his friend Ernie invited him over to, for some par target practice. Ernie had a farm and they set up some uh, uh, shooting range out in the field. Bill was upset with Susie and she knew she hated his guns, so if he went shooting instead of mowing the lawn, well, that would teach her lesson. He knew he shouldn't do it, but he did. He unlocked the cabinet and got out his favorite rifle, a classic Winchester bolt action with a scope. He got a box of ammo, threw them in the trunk of the car, and headed out to Ernie's farm. Ernie was not home, but Bill knew he was welcome to head out to the range on his own. There were targets set up on the, across the field. Most were wooden deer cutouts, but some were of people. Bill and Ernie liked to imagine they were shooting an enemy soldier on the battlefield or a bad guy attacking someone in their family. Fortunately, there was not a Susie-shaped cutout, or Bill might have taken a few shots. He shook that thought off, as terrible as that was. Actually, it was a great stress reliever for him to feel the power of the gun hit its targets. He felt strong. He felt manly. He felt in control. As the sun was starting to set, Bill was thinking it was time to quit and go home. He had waited long enough. Now he would not have to mow the lawn today. He won this round with Susan, but it was a hollow victory. He would still have to mow the lawn tomorrow. Just as he was ready to take his last shot, a beautiful doe and her fawn walked out of the woods and into the range. Bill couldn't believe how stupid they were. Didn't they hear the shots? He lifted his gun to, the sh to his shoulder and watched them through the scope. It would have been so easy to pull the trigger. But as he watched the fawn look up at its mother as if to say, Where are we going, Mom? The doe looked around and sensed the danger, and in a split second they turned around and darted back into the woods and disappeared. Bill loved to hunt, and he felt no guilt about it as long as they ate the meat. But something about that moment got to him. He realized he had the power of life and death over that doe who was only trying to protect her young. It was not a fair fight, deer versus rifle. He put his gun back in the trunk and went home. 
He and Susie didn't say a word to each other that night before going to bed. Bill thought he was going to have to miss church Sunday morning and stay and mow the lawn, but he heard the neighbor boy mowing their, their grass, so he ran out and offered him 20 bucks to take care of their yard, too. So he went to church with Susie. The Bible story was about Peter cutting off the ear of those who came to arrest Jesus. He was just trying to defend his friend, but Jesus told Peter to put down the weapon. He said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. When the pastor started her sermon, she connected the sword of those bygone days to the weapon of choice now, which of course is guns. She gave statistics about gun violence in the country and challenged the notion that the only way to stop gun violence was to have more guns around. She said, can you imagine Jesus ever picking up a gun, even in self-defense? Bill had to think about that one. Did Jesus ever pick up a gun? He thought, well, if someone was going to hurt a child, would Jesus use a gun to take out the bad guy? That question stuck with him all day. That afternoon, they had the birthday party for their granddaughter, Megan. She was turning 10 years old. Bill was grilling hot dogs and hamburgers for everyone. The kids were having fun playing games like beanbag toss and lawn darts. Bill thought about the lawn darts they used to use when he was a kid. Those were, those were real lawn darts. These newfangled lawn darts aren't even darts at all. He made that observation to Sarah, his daughter-in-law, Megan's mother. He was joking, but Sarah was deadly serious. She shot back, Can you believe we have outlawed lawn darts? Because three people were killed. But anyone can buy a gun that is a thousand times more dangerous. Bill wanted to argue with her, but he knew better. He was a proud member of the NRA. He knew all the arguments and he defended the right for law-abiding citizens to buy guns for hunting and self-defense. But even Bill was getting uncomfortable with the proliferation of military-style weapons in the hands of irresponsible people. Bill smiled at Sarah and said, I'm glad they got rid of those lawn darts. I never would forgive myself if one of those kids got hurt by them. Yeah, Sarah replied, like Mom always said, you're going to poke out your eye with one of those things. <laughs> they both laughed because Susie said that about almost anything children ever had in their hands, from pencils to scissors. Every mother loves to say that. You're going to poke your eye out with that thing. After the party, Bill was in a good mood, so he apologized to Susie for being such a jerk the other day. You put on a great party for Megan, and I'm sorry I didn't help more. You did just fine, Susie said. I just wish you wouldn't leave everything to the last minute. By the way, where did you go last night? She asked. I went over to Ernie's. Oh, you took your guns with you, didn't you? Susie observed. I wish you'd get rid of those things. You don't even go hunting anymore. What's the point? And they're so dangerous. What if one of the kids got a hold of them? Well, now Bill regretted apologizing, because <laughs> now he was getting mad. Look, I keep them under lock and key, and I enjoy shooting. Once in a while, it's fun, so leave me alone. They went to bed without speaking again that night. A few days later, they were driving home from the grocery store when they heard the news on the car radio about a shooting at a school in Texas. They rushed home and turned on the TV. For the rest of the day, they were glued to the news of what happened and how many casualties they were. They phoned their kids and told them how much they loved them. Bill thought of little Megan, who just turned 10. She looked about the same age as some of the kids on TV. His heart ached for the families who were devastated by yet more senseless gun violence. That night, Bill just couldn't sleep. He was so upset thinking about those kids and how stupid it is to let 18-year-olds buy military weapons without any training. Couldn't stop thinking about what he saw on the news. They told him about Japan, a country of 125 million people that has only a handful of gun deaths a year. Because it is really hard to buy any kind of gun in that country. He used to think it was crazy to keep people from buying guns, but for the first time, Bill started to think, maybe we're the ones who are crazy. Bill couldn't sleep, so he got out of bed and went back to the living room and 
turned on the TV. There was still more news about the shooting, so he turned it off. He looked around for a magazine and found the one that came with the Sunday paper. As he flipped through it, he came across an article about artists that were taking guns and turning them into sculptures. Some beautiful, some shocking. The article was called Turning Swords into Plowshares. Some artists melted down the guns, which then they could shape into something totally different, like a bird or a butterfly. Other artists took bullet shells and arranged them into words like peace or love. Some even made religious symbols out of the guns, like crosses. You'll remember the sermon from Sunday. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And Bill translated it in his mind, live by the gun, die by the gun. He didn't want to die by guns, and he certainly didn't want any of his grandchildren to be hurt by guns. So he got an inspiration. In his pajamas, he ran out to the garage. He pulled out his rifles and handguns and laid them on the garage floor and started to think, what could he turn them into? Should he tie them together to make a sculpture and put it out on the front lawn? Susie would love that. Or maybe he could spell out some words, and then it came to him like a bolt of lightning. He had three rifles. They could easily make the shape of the letter N. Then he arranged the handguns in a circle to make the letter O. N O. No. Well, no what? No more is what came to mind. He didn't necessarily mean no more guns. He just meant no more. Let's have no more killing, no more shooting, no more families ripped apart. He got a piece of plywood, took the hammer out of each gun so it could never be used again, and nailed, screwed, and glued them to the plywood in a giant note. He then got some red paint and spelled out more. So his message was, no more. Well, it wasn't pretty, and it wouldn't win any awards, but it was powerful. And Bill felt powerful making the statement. He felt even more powerful destroying his guns than he used to feel shooting his guns. He propped up his plywood art piece on the front of his garage door and went to bed. Bill woke up to Susie shaking him. Bill, what have you done now? The neighbors are standing out front of our house. They're pointing at the house. Some are laughing and some even seem angry. I'm scared to go look. What did you do this time? Bill suddenly remembered his work of art and threw on some clothes and ran outside. His plywood art piece looked even more amateurish in daylight than it did in the dark, but he was proud of it nonetheless. When people asked what it meant, he declined to answer. I think it speaks for itself, he said. Some neighbors gave him a thumbs up while others shook their heads and called him all kinds of things under their breath. Over the next few days, his garage door became a focal point of the neighborhood. Some people were leaving flowers as if it was a memorial to the kids in Texas. Others had thrown eggs and tomatoes at it. And Bill thought it all added to the power of the statement. On Friday, the local TV news people came by and wanted to do a story about his garage art. Susie told Billy to shave first. Put on a clean shirt and get rid of that old hat that says, Best Grandpa Ever. Well, he put on his favorite Mets t-shirt, but kept the hat, and went outside for his 15 minutes of fame. The reporter asked if he was against the Second Amendment. Bill thought for a moment and then said, You know, I've been a proud gun owner all my life, but after seeing what guns are doing to our country, and especially to our kids, I just thought, no more. What do you mean by no more, asked the reporter. No more guns? Bill savored the moment. He was on a roll. He had never felt so wise and important as he did right there and then. And with the camera pointed at him and a microphone in his face, he said, It's no more. You fill in the blank. The reporter asked, No more weapons? Sure, Bill said. No more excuses? Sure, Bill said. No more killing? Of course, Bill said. Then Bill paraphrased what he heard in the sermon. You know, the good book tells us that if we live by the gun, we're going to die by the gun. I'd rather live without guns than die by guns, wouldn't you? 
The reporter stopped for a moment. She didn't know what to say. Finally, she asked, where did you get the inspiration for this provo provocative work of... She didn't know what to call it. <laughs> so Bill finished the thought. Where did I get the inspiration for this work of art? I think you might call it ironic, but I got it by looking through the scope of my gun the other day. I saw a deer and her fawn. It made me think of parents everywhere who love their children. They want a new world for them, a safer world. And that world is within our sight. All we have to do is say, no more. Amen. Let us sing this.